And so now that we're done talking about hemostasis, we can talk about blood grouping. So the plasma membrane of our red blood cells have special glycoproteins. Uh, these glycoproteins differ among individuals because they can be seen as foreign by other blood types. These glycoproteins are called antigens or agglutinogens. And there are up to 50 different antigens on a person's red blood cells. So uh, antibodies bind to these antigens resulting in agglutination, agglutination or hemolysis of red blood cells. So clumping or rupture of them. So we don't want that. And there are different groups when we're talking about it. We have the ABO and then the RH groups. We'll go ahead and break it down now. So normally the body must be exposed to a foreign antigen before an antibody can be produced, but this is not the case for the ABO blood group. Individuals with type A blood without any prior exposure to incompatible blood have preformed antibodies to the B antigen that circulates in their blood plasma. All right, so the A uh, blood type has anti-B an antibodies automatically. And this is to prevent when uh, a foreign blood type comes in uh, from mixing because that would just cause an inflammatory response and an immune response. So these antibodies, referred to as anti-B antibodies, will cause agglutination and hemolysis if they ever encounter erythrocytes with B antigens. My mouse died. There we go. Similarly, an individual with type B blood has preformed anti-A antibodies. Individuals with type AB blood, which has both antigens, both little dudes in the glycocalyx, um, they don't have preformed antibodies to either of the types because they would have an immune response if they did, but they can accept both, so they don't have antibodies to them. They don't need to be able to recognize them as bad. Thus, they are universal recipients. So they can receive blood from type A, type B, AB, or O, um, making them universal recipients. And people with type O, on the other hand, have no antigens, so no A or B antigens on their surface. And so they have both A and B antibodies and they circulate through the blood. Making them universal donors, they can give their blood to anybody because they won't have any antigens and so they won't be recognized by AB, right? Because AB doesn't care. B, they're only looking for anti-A. Well, they're not on O. And then A, they're only looking for anti-B. Well, they're not on O. So O can be donated to anybody, but O cannot receive from anybody except for O. All right? So there'll be some questions on your homework and lecture quizzes uh, related to this. So get this straight. O can give blood to anybody. AB can receive blood from anybody. AB cannot give blood to anybody unless it's AB. O cannot... Uh, receive blood from anybody unless it's O. Then the other blood group is RH. It's an antigen that's similar to A and B. You see the little spikes, this is the RH factor. So this is the antigen on the red blood cells. You're either RH positive having it or RH negative not having it. It's, it was first studied in rhesus monkeys, hence the RH. Um, hemolytic disease of the newborn is when the mother produces an anti-RH antibody, so they are RH, so the mother is RH negative, but the baby is RH positive, and so then the mother produces, you know, anti-RH like antibodies that cross the placenta and then cause agglutination and hemolysis of fetal red blood cells, which is obviously not good for the baby. But before I move on to um, that, I just want to make sure. We're all clear when it comes to ABO and RH, you can be A, A positive or B positive or A negative or B negative. The positive and negative just is resembling RH. And so if you're AB positive, that means you are AB blood type and then RH positive. If you are O negative, you are O blood type and then RH negative. All right. 
it could be O positive too. O negative is the one that is the universal recipient. But uh, so the hemolytic disease of the newborn, think of it as mother being uh, Rh negative, and then baby being Rh positive, which is genetic. You know, dad might be Rh positive, or has to be if mom is Rh negative. I suppose not has to be, but we're not going to get into the genetics of it. But um, baby is Rh positive. Well, mom's Rh negative red blood cell has. Uh, um, sorry, mom has anti-RH antibodies f f like um, in her bloodstream and those go on to recognize the positive RH blood vessels in the baby, which is not good because then that will cause hemolysis and the agglutination of the baby's blood. So that was just a quick aside, a condition that can be uh, fatal for babies. It's usually... Uh, only an issue basically once the mother is on the second pregnancy so for the first pregnancy it's not a problem because the blood doesn't necessarily mix but after that baby is born it's usually been uh, encountered by the mother and then she starts to produce anti-rh antibodies and then if the next baby is also rh positive that is when it's usually an issue Okay, now we can go ahead and chat about the heart. So the heart, we want to make sure we understand functions of the heart, understand the anatomy of the heart. We want to be able to trace the blood flow through the heart and understand the cardiac cycle that contributes to the physiology of the heart. So functions of the heart include generating blood pressure, routing the blood, so separating pulmonary and systemic circulations, ensuring one-way blood flow via heart valves, and then regulating our blood supply by changing the contraction rate and force of the match of the blood delivery to changing metabolic demands. So we wanna make sure that um, the blood is supplied to all the tissues in need at a regular rate, and if they don't need it as much, we don't have to supply it as uh, quickly. And so we can change the contraction rate and the force to match blood delivery necessity. So what is the heart composed of? You've got layers, the endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium. Oh, quick aside, this particular part of the lecture is very color heavy. And the reason I have so many colors is I'm trying to drill it into your brains what is deoxygenated, what is oxygenated, and what could be both. And so by what could be both, I mean uh, something that has uh, some aspects that are deoxygenated and some aspects that are oxygenated. So everything that's oxygenated will be red, everything that is deoxygenated will be blue, and things that could be either will be purple. So the endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium make up the tissues of the heart. I just have them labeled in red, just like the heart, um, different aspects of them. It's just, it's just tissue, so it just it's not deoxygenated or oxygenated or anything like that. But chambers right and left ventricles of the and atrias. So right ventricle is going to be deoxygenated, left ventricle is going to be deoxygenated, right atria, left atria. So that's, so purple is kind of going for both, red, blue. Um, we'll get to that in a bit. So this is just kind of a summary slide. Valves, left and right atrioventricular valves, and then pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves. And then blood vessels, we have the aorta, the pulmonary, pulmonary trunk slash arteries, superior and inferior vena cava, and then the pulmonary veins. This is all looking like nonsense and foreign to you, but we will break it down and you will get it by the end of this lecture. Layers of the heart, we have the epicardium, which is the visceral, visceral pericardium. So this is this epicardium here. And the out, outer layers here are everything that surrounds the heart. Um, so such as the pericardial cavity and the parietal layer and fibrous pericardium. You don't have to know those right now. Just understand the epicardium is the actual outer layer of the heart. Myocardium is this incredibly thick middle layer that is composed of those muscle cells of the, of the heart. And the endocardium is the inner lining of connective tissue. It's kind of like an endothelial layer that is continuous with blood vessels actually. 